All right, so let's put that question aside. More important is the effect, the impact of John Brown's raid. Very profound, both north and south. In the north, the execution, more than the event, makes him a martyr in many places. Now, of course, a lot of people, politicians, are, no, forget it, we have nothing to do with John Brown. Abraham Lincoln, in the Cooper Union speech here in New York in early 1860, says, Republicans are blamed. Republicans are blamed by the South for John Brown's raid. We have nothing to do with John Brown's raid. John Brown was not a Republican. I never met John Brown. And John Brown was ridiculous, he says. In fact, he said the slaves, ignorant as they are, were smart enough to realize that this was a crazy scheme and not rise up. So John Brown's a lone individual, says Lincoln, and should not be associated with the Republican Party or the North. On the other hand, as I say, there seems to be a large groundswell of sentiment, if not supporting John Brown's action, certainly opposing his execution and seeing him as a martyr. Um, Wendell Phillips, the great abolitionist, says, how vast the change in men's hearts. I find the hatred of slavery greatly intensified by the fate of Brown. Men are ready to march to Virginia, an exaggeration, but within less than a year and a half, they would be marching into Virginia, and many of them would be singing a song called John Brown's Body. John Brown becomes an inspiration to at least some who are going to be in the, um, in the Civil War. Many of the eulogies of John Brown um, Many of the eulogies of John Brown um, talk about violence in a new way. They, talk of, they, they reflect an acceptance of violence that, as a way of attacking slavery, which is what John Brown is kind of aiming at. Um, to abolitionists, Brown represented, I think, the, a, a symbol or an ex example of what you might call disinterested action. Disinter not uninterested, that, this is another one of my rules of English grammar. Disinterested does not mean you lack interest on TV all the time. You say, I'm disinterested. No, I'm uninterested, I don't care. Disinterested means you don't have a dog in the fight. You are impartial, you are an umpire. Disinterested action, action that does not affect your own interests. It's for the good of somebody else in a materialist, selfish society, as many abolitionists thought the society was, Brown represents someone who gets beyond self-interest to act for some cause outside of himself. And many historians accept that. I mean, one of the more recent books by a very good scholar, David Reynolds, has the rather long title, the title of the, title, uh, the, title of the biography is John Brown, the man who killed slavery, sparked the Civil War, and seeded the Civil Rights Movement. That's a mouthful for one person. Uh, but it shows you this legend of John Brown, how powerful, how powerful it can be. And it develops right at the time. Um, here's John Brown being led to the, out of the courthouse. He's got the flag of Virginia behind him, Sic Semper Tyrannis. Such will be the fate of tyrants, or something like that. My Latin isn't so good. Which, by the way, who yelled that on a famous night in American history? John Wilkes Booth. Thank you. John Wilkes Booth said that after he shot Lincoln and jumped onto the stage at Ford's Theater. But here it is. But, here, but here's the thing. You see, there is a black woman seated in front of John Brown with her baby. And according to legend, Brown stops, picks up the baby, and kisses it, and then goes on his way. But you see, this is the juxtaposition of Brown and slavery and emancipation, the idea that this child will be free pretty soon because of the actions of John Brown, among other things, I guess. Now, in the South, the reaction was equally strong, but the opposite. John, here was, the, ab, Southerners for years had been charging, claiming that the abolitionist movement was bent on invading the South. 
bent on stirring up a slave insurrection. Yeah, they publish their newspapers, they talk about moral suasion, their real aim is to get our slaves to cut our throats. And here was the nightmare of the South actually embodied, a white abolitionist with a small band invading the South. Okay, it didn't work, but if the Republicans come to power in the federal government, there's going to be more and more John Browns. In other words, it heightens support for the notion of secession, which, as we'll see next time, is building in the South at this time. And the martyrdom of John Brown in the North reinforces that Southern, Southern reaction. Brown is not condemned as a criminal, not condemned as a murderer. He's exalted, and that shows the great divide. In fact, newspapers in the South whip up fear of slave insurrections and, uh, and you know, rumors of plots all over the place in the spring and summer of 1860. Um, they saw the mo they didn't take too seriously the disclaimers of Lincoln and Seward and others. They saw the martyrdom of John Brown in the North, and that persuaded them about uh, Brown's, you know, so this, this it helped to further divide North and South. Um, so, and African Americans idolized John Brown. That's one of the things that's important to remember. Blacks in the North, in Canada, made John Brown immediately into a tremendous hero. Not only in the United States, the largest funeral event for John Brown took place in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, where a giant procession marched through the capital of Haiti with a, with a uh, casket, so to speak, an empty coffin, um, with a sign on it, the hero of liberty. So to blacks, this was a guy who sacrificed himself for them, which wasn't all that common. And subsequently, people, for example, Stokely Carmichael, uh, the, the, the guy who popularized the term black power in the mid to late 1960s, said at the time of black power, partly just to annoy people, uh, uh, white people, they said, there's only two white people in American history that I admire. Who were the two? John Brown and Thaddeus Stevens. Thaddeus Stevens, the radical Republican who tried to get land distributed to the former slaves after the Civil War. John Brown, one of the two white people he admires in, um, in American history. Um, so if Brown's raid proves anything, it is that it is the dramatic, violent act that galvanizes, galvanizes public sentiment. It crystallizes, polarizes public sentiment. Um, and in that sense, you could possibly say that Brown's raid was the first blow of the Civil War. Turned out to be, anyway. Frederick Douglass, this is what Fre how Frederick Douglass put it, which I think is not bad. He says, until this blow was struck, the prospect for freedom was dim. The irrepressible conflict was one of words and votes. John Brown, here he's getting rhetorical, when John Brown stretched forth his arm, the sky was cleared and the hosts of freedom stood face to face over the chasm of a broken union. The clash of arms was at hand. The clash of arms at hand. Didn't quite begin, but it was at In other words, to put it a little more simply, it brought closer the day of civil war, whether it was the first blow of the civil war, I don't know. But what everyone thinks of John Brown, and there's a million opinions about there, I guess the bottom line is simply that Brown's career and actions put, put on our agenda a basic question which exists today, it exists at all points of history, which is how do you combat an evil system? especially when peaceful means do not seem available. There is no right and wrong answer to that question, obviously. People have all sorts of answers to it, but Brown puts it on the agenda uh, in a way that it hadn't been before. 